Chapters One and Two of Just Sweethearts, a Christmas Love Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Just Sweethearts, a Christmas Love Story by Harry Stillwell Edwards. Chapter One bathed in the sunshine of one of those perfect days which so often come with christmas in the south he stood at the street corner a light cane across his shoulders supporting his gloved hands his eyes shifting with ever-changing interest and a half smile on his swarthy face it was written all over him that he had no appointments to meet no duties to discharge that he was by chance only in the moving picture and not of the cast and that the whole thing, so far as he was concerned, was but a transient show to be enjoyed for its brilliancy of colors and its endless succession of fine southern faces. But here was idleness without inertia. Clearly he was one of those rare beings who can radiate energy, standing still, and convey the impression of impetuous force without motion, a trick of the eyes, a refusal to sag name ladies and gentlemen meet king dubignon king saw her first as she started across cherry street from the far corner a slender figure moving with grace and assurance through the dangerous procession of motor-cars still handled in the south as new toys and once or twice his lips parted for a warning cry but she gained the opposite corner with ease and turned straight toward him across third now, of all the throng, his alert eyes clung to this approaching figure and began to take note of details. White spats, plain tailor suit, loose blousy waist, and flat hat with its little veil of black lace. Soon she was directly in front, but her demure gaze was not for him. She was mentally preoccupied. She had thoughts of her own, and not having seen the Dumignon eyes and smile, she failed to look back after she passed. The young man released a suspended breath likened to the fervid sigh of a cow settling down to rest, lowered his cane, and stood gazing after the receding figure. And not he only, as he noticed with quick jealousy. Every man and woman who met her turned for a second glance. The gentian eyes, radiant face, curved lips, parted in a half-smile, belonged in an artist's dream, the slender, supple figure borne along on dainty feet, the subtle grace of her moving, line vanishing into line, curve melting into curve, the free, elastic, boyish stride, were combinations notable even in the city of beautiful women, as the aborigines called their Macon. King was an artist and had dreamed. He had lost something out of his dreams, and now he found something to place in one. He followed and saw her vanish into the crowd of a cheap store, an emporium of ten-cent things, and presently his broad shoulders opened up a path there for himself. Down one aisle and up another, and then he found her. She was critically examining lace at ten cents the yard, and did not look up as he passed. The purchase of lace of any kind is a tax on all the faculties if one is faithful. Checkmate? No. Inspiration. He went forward to the turn of the aisle at the show window near the door. It had occurred to him that sooner or later she would pass out. He took his stand in a little bay of space nearby and waited. Time was no object to him at such a crisis. When he saw her coming again, threading her way through the crowd, and almost without contact, he so maneuvered that she drifted naturally into the little bay, promptly vacated for her accommodation. Instantly he was standing directly in front, hat in hand, arresting her departure. "'Beautiful, just a moment, please,' he said, smiling down. "'I saw you crossing the street and followed you here.' When you leave, I shall not follow again. Listen, what I am asking is that you will take my card and have your father or somebody inquire about me of one of the bank cashiers on the corner, and then write me your address, won't you? This isn't regular, I know. 
he continued with increase of vocal momentum, but it is necessary, absolutely necessary. I have searched and waited for you all my life, and if I lose you now, it may be forever. The girl had drawn back a little and was looking into his face with wonder, but without alarm. The Dumignon eyes and smile were irresistible. Nevertheless, now that he had spoken, words altogether different from the formal ones planned, King became self-conscious and troubled. Something jarred. Perhaps it was the twentieth century or the ten-cent store. Besides, he was pointing a piece of cardboard at her in what must have seemed a very absurd way. She felt instantly his embarrassment, and women of all ages gain composure when men in their presence lose it. The instinctive response of eyes and lips, vibrant life to impetuous youth, was checked, and a tiny perpendicular line divided her brows. "'Are you quite sane?' she began, her voice reduced almost to a whisper. He thanked God for that. "'Stand aside, please, or shall I send for the manager?' "'Perfectly sane,' he said, moving aside, but still holding out the card. "'You will not send for anyone, because now the way is open. But all the same, I wish, awfully, you would take my card, and when you get home, decide. Won't you please? It's just a little lonesome card,' he added whimsically. The girl hesitated questioning him with the wonderful gentian eyes, into which, now of a sudden, came a fixed light. A white wonder paled her face for a fleeting instant, and she moved a step nearer. Doubtingly, the gesture clearly an unconscious one, her hand touched his arm. "'Have I ever seen you before? Do you know my name?' He shook his head, smiling happily. She watched the smile with open interest. "'Think again,' she urged earnestly. He was deeply troubled. He wished that he might say he had met her as a summer girl somewhere, but he could not. What he did say was, "'It may strike you as absurd, but I have only seen you in a dream, a long dream.' She smiled over this, and with sudden decision took the card, dropping it into her shopping bag. "'You are not to follow. You promised.' Cross my heart, I shall remain here fifteen minutes. Can you vanish back into your sunbeam in fifteen minutes? <laughs> Completely. Her little laugh was the finest thing he had ever heard. She smiled up into his face and passed out. Fifteen minutes later, having, with the aid of a little lady of blonde accomplishments, selected a dozen pairs of crimson and green socks and paid for them, he looked at his watch. "'My dear,' he said, "'I've changed my mind. "'There's really no room in my grip for this bundle. "'Christmas is at hand. "'Kindly hand them to Mother, with my best wishes.' "'And I have no Mother, and I never saw him before,' "'she said to the floor-walker hysterically. "'And red and green socks?' "'Easy, Mash,' he laughed. "'He'll be back. "'Exchange for something else.' She opened a tiny vanity box and powdered her nose. It was ammunition wasted. Fate is a merry jade at times. Halfway to Jacksonville in a Pullman next day, a young woman with gentian eyes, who had time and again searched her handbag, opened a package of cheap lace to finish dressing a Christmas doll, and a card dropped out. It bore the inscription, King du Mignon. Underneath was penciled the information that he was associated with Beaker, Toomer, and Church, Architects, New York, and to this was added Hotel Dempsey, Macon, three days. Fate's little jest was the concealment of the card in a fold of the paper wrapper for twenty-four hours. CHAPTER Two. When King Dumignon left Cornell and some seven hundred who had labored with him through several years of architecture and watercolor, he bore with him the consciousness that final examples of his work, left there, had not been excelled, and the memory of many friendly assurances that his place was waiting for him out in the great world. 
that he construed these assurances too literally was the fault of his temperament and so perfectly natural home yearning pulled him back to his beloved south for the initial plunge and it was not long before his name in guilt invited the confidence of the good people of macon who had castles in the air the field proved narrow and depressing for one of his profession and temperament the seven-room cottage of many colors seemed the limit of popular imagination at that time this for a young man who was bursting with ideas and who dreamed of thirty-five-story buildings and marble palaces printing graceful lines against skies of blue the years that slipped held some minor triumphs but he classed them as time wasted then a provincial board turned down his modern school building for a combination barn silo and garage designed by somebody's nephew and the proverbial straw was on the celebrated camel's back it was a spring day when the camel's spine collapsed birds were building homes for themselves and wonderful flowers were solving without human aid marvels of form and color and voices were calling to him across years unborn ah those voices he placed a foot under the corner of his drawing-table and wrecked it against the wall three days later he was in new york that mecca of ambitious young southerners and at the door of beaker toomer and church esteemed by him and many another as the great city's leading architects mr church the junior partner heard his application a little smile hovered about the man's thin lips and a slight movement of the lines leading southeast and southwest from the nostrils expressed a cynical weariness on an average said he with an air of calculation we have applications from cornell men at the rate of six a week and there are others he waved a hand feebly toward a vista of rooms with bending forms therein we can't always keep the crowd we have busy i know all about that said king coolly but perhaps you need a man in this special line art glass stained glass windows he opened a portfolio and laid some designs before the architect now while no artist listens with patience to business argument none refuses to listen to pictures mr church looked carelessly at first then with a distinct show of interest the sheets slipped rapidly through his hands and he shot a swift glance at his visitor these yours yes mr church pressed a button somewhere his eyes still on the designs a little gate opened come in he said and king dubignon stood at the threshold of his career back in the junior partner's office the designs were more carefully examined very creditable was the grudging admission it so happens that we may be able to use a man in this line temporarily be seated he disappeared when he returned he was accompanied by a stout man of perhaps forty-five prompt of manner and with a face that seemed to have been carved from tinted marble after a greek model this one with quick eye examined the designs which he handled as an expert handles sevres excellent yours yes said king where are you from georgia learn this down there Oh, partly and partly at cornell nothing finer ever in this office church you want to work with us i suppose this to king if agreeable sir all right how does twenty five hundred strike you for a starter fine and then just what i made last year building freak cottages mr beaker laughed i know served my time on them the young wife brings you a homemade ground plan providing for hotel accommodations and wants a roof put over it bay windows port cashier etc cries when she finds your roof will cost more than her cottage you'll be under mr church mr uh, dubignon good old name any advice needed drop in on me he shook hands and turned away but came back and placed a finger on the pictures i say church how about the memorial windows 
"'Yes, I think Mr. Dumignon might help. "'Better give him a free hand on it.' A sudden flush overspread the Southerner's face, and his look of gratitude followed the great architect. But if King looked for sudden fame in New York, he was disappointed. Putting aside his ambition for the time being, he threw himself into the task of developing along the special line he had chosen for a foothold, with the same ardor that had carried him to the front at college, and his work stood all tests easily. Beaker, Toomer, and Church became headquarters for art glass designs in architecture. Presently his salary rose, and then again, and at length he found himself independent. But to use his own expression, he got nowhere. The reason was simple. It was a rule of the office that all designs should bear the firm's name only. Church had carefully explained this in the beginning. Church had also seen to it that press notices of their notable work invariably mentioned that Ralph Church was the head of the department responsible for it. King writhed under this system, but he could not budge without financial backing. He was heartily tired of his narrow field. At odd times, in his own living room, he worked on his ambitious dream. The dream of the young architect was a thirty-five-story office building, wherein utility was to be combined with beauty, without sacrifice of dividend-paying space or money, and without offense to the artistic eye from any point of view. Many architects have wrestled with the same problem, and some with brilliant results. Now, by strange coincidence, a thirty-five-story office building for Chicago, financed in New York, began to be talked of in building circles. No plans had been asked, no consultation with architects had. A rumor had started and was kicked around as a football. King took the backward trail and patiently followed it into the office of a certain great banker whose young woman secretary had a friend that served an afternoon paper in repertorial capacity. Here King met his Waterloo, for no man in New York was less accessible than this particular banker who had once received a black hand letter. Red tape, red-headed office boy, confidential clerks, private secretary, hemmed him in from all but his selected associates, and the banker's offices were full of unsuspected exits. All roads led from his Rome. King stalled at the red-headed boy, the extreme outer guard. It was at this stage of his career that he put aside ambition and raced off to Georgia for a few days along the coast. One proved sufficient. He spent that laying holly wreaths on graves under mossy live oaks. Then he betook himself to Macon to lunch and dine and sup with his old-time S.A.E. friends of Mercer, seen of his earliest college years. He found them in law offices, doctor shops, banks, and trade, glad to see him, but busy. Then, bankrupt of emotions, he began to stand on the street corners during their busy hours and watch the people pass. And watching thus, he had seen her. And finally, after three days more in his hotel, much boring of friends and many fruitless chases of false rumors, and hours in front of Wesleyan College, he had arrived at the conclusion that he was, after all, a sublime ass. Bearing this added burden, he had taken himself off to New York, in what old-time writers were pleased to call a frame of mind. But at the bottom of a formidable array of Christmas greetings piled on his desk by his devoted friend, Terence the office boy, he found an envelope postmarked Jacksonville, Florida, December 25. Within was a card, one of the kind sold five for a nickel, bearing these lines. I found your card in my bag on my way to Florida, and keeping it in memory of the only impudence I have ever encountered at the hands of a man. Nevertheless, I am wishing for you a very happy Christmas and New Year. This, I take it, is the proper Christmas spirit. Beautiful. P.S. Very likely I shall return to New York before Easter. And for King Dubignon, Christmas came back. Also for Terence, 
The tip was five dollars and an injunction. Small boy, note this handwriting. You will perceive that it is more of a jumping than a running hand. Well, it belongs on the top of all mail. Understand? I'm on, said Terence with his broadest grin. Return to New York, quoted King, self-communing. I should have known from the way she crossed the street she belonged in New York. Sir? On your way, Terence, on your way. But this with a smile. End of chapters 1 and 2